schools, uh, then they get another one and so on. You have, the families have a certain amount of choice as to what they are exposing their children to, and that isn't always possible because economic sanctions come into it. But we have protected ourselves against too much regimentation just through the variety of schools available. And in a given school, you get variety just because of the availability or the lack of it of people who can teach various things. I think we do need to look at the, the values which underlie an educational system. Now, I don't think the answer is to throw everything out or leave it up to the student, because the student, I think, is least of all able to say what he should be studying. His, his uh, values will be all tied up with immediate gratification and what he, what he is interested in now, but he's there to acquire behavior which will pay off sometime in the future, and people who've been around are more likely to know what that future is like and uh, what is to be done. But you're saying that the individual choice comes in, in say the case of, of uh, elementary school children, where their parents can choose the kinds of values as represented by different kinds of educational institutions. What the technology does is provide a systematic way to help them accomplish their educational goals. They're not values per se smuggled in, in, the guide, in under the guise of the technology. No, the, the values are not in the technology at all. I can imagine a parochial school becoming extremely powerful in teaching religion of a particular kind. I can imagine, um, let us say, a business school becoming extremely powerful in building certain kinds of businessmen for, for our current American way of life, supported by current businesses who want, employ want new employees and, uh, which have had this preparation and so on. This, we could, simply by making education more powerful, tend to clinch the status quo, which I think would be bad because right now we profit from the fact that people aren't well educated and hence have a certain flexibility when they, when they start living after they've got out of, uh, of education. But if you, and I think we are at the point where, where we could be much more effective, and that means we must take a much closer look at why we are teaching what we're teaching. How would you redesign our elementary and high schools? Well, I think we, we are in a position to do that if we were allowed to do it. But right now, there are very powerful educational philosophies, particularly those associated with giving the student more freedom, which is a natural reaction against the punitive kind of thing, which I react against also, but which seems to me have no future whatsoever. Why is that? Uh, well, because they, they are mistaking the apparent pleasure and joy of the child doing his thing for progress. Now, it's progress in the sense that it's away from sitting with your hands folded, as I did when I was in first grade, when I wasn't aware, and I sat with my hands folded on the desk. Uh, I'm, I want to get away from that, too. But I want to give students additional reasons for doing the kinds of things which will develop them and allow them to, to do the things of which they're capable. Well, that's one, one reason why we're, we're not doing what we're doing now. And uh, I, would want to, I would want to see a, a clearer understanding of why students come to school, learn something, remember it, and that kind of thing. And that, that could be done. And it, it better instructional materials can certainly be prepared. And I think right now a very promising thing is, uh, is the application of this to college and the university. Uh, the, um, the, the, the Keller system of redesigning a course of instruction is spreading very rapidly and it, it, I've seen it in work, at work and, and in actual institutions and there's no question that uh, students become involved in the subject matter and get a great deal more in return for the time and energy they spend. We can, we can do that, we, can, we could redesign the whole thing, you know, but there are all sorts of problems arise the very, the very structure of the educational establishment is opposed to improvement. How does that operate? Well, supposing you could teach twice as much uh, with the same time and energy. In other words, in the first grade, the child would learn what is now taught in the first and second grades. Mm -hmm. So what does he get in the second grade? Well, he gets the third and fourth. 
Uh, and this means, of course, your teachers are going to have to be changed around. You've got to redesign your schools because some children will do that and some won't. You've got to allow for individual progress. You can no longer have a bunch of students moving along at the same pace. The more you dump them on the job market too early because they've finished high school <laughs> at a much earlier age, and then they can't get jobs, and then they get into the streets and become delinquents and all that kind of thing. In England, they have put up the terminal age one year just to protect the job market. They won't admit that, but I think that's what is done. And uh, it, it, you, don't, you don't want to finish an education any sooner. Our present culture can't take that. Well, that means that you're not to be allowed to improve teaching, because improving teaching means you're going to, going to teach it a lot faster. Now, the answer to that, of course, is you teach them a lot more while you're at it. And uh, that, I would, I would say, is, is the thing to do. Where would you begin? Uh, well, I think the only uh, real way to bring about a change is to show what can be done. I, there are all sorts of reasons why people aren't improving education. It causes trouble. There's no particular reason to. A teacher or an administrator isn't going to suffer very much for missing a chance to improve teaching. But mainly, I think it is they don't know what to do. And uh, those uh, who have, have some, some suggestions to make simply have to, have to demonstrate that they work, I think. I had hoped that the performance contract thing might have done this by bringing into schools uh, specific programs. And to some extent, I think uh, it did. But it also brought in a lot of uh, very inadequate proposals and, and, and techniques. And some kind of an entering wedge is needed. I think when teachers see what can be done, they will do it, because teachers are humane people. They want, want students to learn. I, I would suggest some kind of, of uh, basic research and then some, some projects to demonstrate what can be done. In the, in the medical profession, we now recognize that better practices will not come from practicing physicians. They will come from basic science. In teaching, it is still believed that classroom experience is the source of all wisdom, and that if there's going to be any improvement, it's going to be done by teachers. That isn't true either. We have, have, I think, to persuade teachers that they should look for and use new practices coming from outside, and the outside, in that case, means, I think, the psychological laboratory. And what from the psychological laboratory would you single out? Well, I think contingency management, the, the development of better reinforcing contingencies in the classroom is the first step, and the preparation of better uh, instructional materials, largely programmed. I think we have to realize that we are preparing people to be effective outside educational institutions, not in educational institutions. This means getting along effectively in the natural environment and in the natural social environment. That is to say, a uh, social environment hasn't been constructed for instructional purposes, and the teacher must turn the child over to the real world just as soon as possible. And it's, it's often um, attempting to do the wrong thing. I've often used the example of the parent who is so anxious to arouse the child's interest that he does things that the child should have the privilege of doing himself. For example, you buy a gadget that makes an interesting noise, for example, and you bring it home to your small child, and you say, oh, look, and then you make the noise, and you put it down, and then the child imitates you and makes the noise, and that's fine. But you have missed a terrific opportunity. If you put this quietly down and allow the child to explore it a bit, and suddenly it makes a noise for the first time when the child is operating it, then the child will be reinforced for his exploratory behavior, and he will go out and explore the rest of nature. But you've cut, undercut, you've, you've destroyed the contingencies which would reinforce exploration by demonstrating this. And yet it's so tempting. You brought home a lot of something, it's a lot of fun making this noise, and so you immediately get the child to make this noise, but you've, you've lost a, a marvelous chance.